man's ambition to tame water has led to some incredible construction projects. Dams, canals, and even polders to reclaim huge tracts of land from the sea. Frederick Restagno is a physicist, an expert in fluid dynamics, and a researcher at the CNRS. He's going to take a look at the work of engineers who have marked our planet's history. Every single day there was something to resolve. Now when you look back, you're like, wow, we overcome a lot, but you learn. These visionaries tackled immense projects to protect themselves from the often devastating effects of water. Everything had to be invented. Nowhere in the world had a structure like this ever been built. And also to harness its tremendous power. Our scientific investigation will help understand how these extraordinary technical challenges have redrawn the landscapes of the planet. It's the story of tenacious engineers who in just a few centuries became the masters of water. It was here in Corinth, almost 3,000 years ago, that the idea of building a major canal was first mooted. The Corinth Canal. Viewed from the sky, it's a trench of more than six kilometers long, a line between two seas, a spectacular etching of man's desire to master time. It's a godsend for the 11,000 boats that use the Corinth Canal each year. This rocky corridor, dug into the narrow strip of land known as an isthmus, avoids a 400-kilometer detour around the Peloponnese. After the failure of projects dating back to Greek and Roman antiquity, the idea of the Corinth Canal fell by the wayside for almost 2,000 years. But the development of shipping traffic and world trade in the 19th century reawakened the ambitions of the Greek people. The governor decided that he wanted Greece to develop. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 was a, another ringing bell for, for Greece to move forward. And uh, well, the works began in 1882 after quite an ordeal with studies, um, financial issues. How much earth and rock would need to be dug out to produce a trench like this between the Peloponnese and Greece? That's more than 12 million cubic meters of earth that has been excavated here. And we're talking more than 2,000 workers that were involved in the project. Also, dynamite and nitroglycerin was one of the first projects of uh, construction, like the canal, that has been used here. But nitroglycerin is really dangerous. <laughs> it is, but um, they've tried it. <laughs> so you can see the results. The Maritime Canal was completed in just 10 years. The Corinth Canal's simple construction is called a sea level canal, meaning that it's hewn out at the level of the two seas it connects, which feed it constantly with salt water. The technical challenge becomes much greater when fluvial channels have to be bored over long distances. Rivers and watercourses must be diverted to supply these artificial channels with fresh water and force them through the landscape. How to guide a ship up a significant gradient? In the 16th century, an invention came along that revolutionized the science of canals, the lock. In addition to its emblematic river, the Seine, since the 19th century, Paris has boasted three lock canals with a total length of 130 kilometers. The Canal Saint-Denis, the Canal de l'Ourc, and the shortest but most famous, the Canal Saint-Martin. Its nine locks allow boats to travel in both directions and negotiate an elevation of almost 26 meters between the artificial watercourse and the river. 
The waterfall at each of these locks is something like three meters or one story. Each lock acts like a boat lift. When a boat takes a reach and enters the lock chamber, a set of mitre gates form an angle pointing upstream so that the water tends to close the gates and divert the pressure onto the banks. Once closed, the lock is then emptied downstream to the lower level, thanks to a paddle, a small sliding hatch on the gate of the lock that acts as a valve. Its role is to fill or empty the lock to balance the water level and therefore the pressure on each side of the gate to facilitate opening. Initially built of modest size to facilitate irrigation in the 19th century, the development of large canals became vital for both national and international trade by reducing the distances traveled in transporting goods. Huge projects began to see the light of day, such as the Suez Canal and the Panama Canal. The man behind both of these humongous projects was the very knowledgeable Ferdinand de Lesseps. The construction of the Suez Canal began in 1859. Plans drawn up by the ambitious de Lesseps involved digging a 162-kilometer trench through the desert to connect Europe with Asia without bypassing Africa and the treacherous seas of the Cape of Good Hope. Tens of thousands of Egyptian laborers began the work by hand. Excavators and pickaxes were replaced a few years later by dredging machines. Such inventions resulting from the advent of steam significantly reduced the need for manpower. On November the 17th, 1869, the new waterway was solemnly opened the channel was admired by the whole world. For its creator, the canal's completion was a crowning glory. Ferdinand de Lesseps, Ferdinand de Lesseps achieved a level of glory which is unimaginable today. He went on to tackle international relations and the construction of the Statue of Liberty. Although he wasn't a writer, he was even invited to join the Académie Française. His success led to his skills being somewhat overestimated, and de Lesseps was convinced that he was the best man to oversee the construction of the Panama Canal. This project, though, proved to be a far more complex one. Frédéric Restagno went to Panama to trace the nightmarish story of the construction of this canal. This small Central American country, a strip of 725 kilometers of land between Latin America and North America, separates the Atlantic from the Pacific. In the narrowest area of the isthmus, covered by dense, humid jungle, the man known as the Great Frenchman embarked upon the construction of his new inter-oceanic maritime canal. But the diplomat, blinded by glory, underestimated the climatic, geological, and economic hurdles that would have to be overcome. And despite the reluctance of certain advisors, work began in 1882. As well as discovering a dense tropical forest flooded by torrential rains, workers faced another major difficulty. A mountainous area, the Culebra, which rises to 95 meters above sea level. They had the geography figured out, but not the geology. They thought they could carve their way through the mountain, a little like the Corinth Canal. This turned out to be very crumbly rock, and digging it triggered landslides. And those landslides, facilitated by the heavy rains, destroyed all the sites. So they kept having to start again. It really was a Sisyphean task. Before long, the workers were suffering from unfamiliar diseases. The truth was that the area was infested with mosquitoes, carrying yellow fever and malaria. Death was cutting them down, one by one, under the helpless gaze of the doctors. Back then, physicians simply didn't have the scientific knowledge to fight these diseases. Mm -hmm. 
As an example, they thought that putting a basin of water at the foot of the bed prevented ants from climbing up to the patient. What actually happened was that the mosquitoes were laying their eggs in the water. So hospitals were propagating the diseases they were trying to fight. Tens of thousands of workers died. It was a major factor in Ferdinand de Lesseps' downfall. Unable to stem the epidemic, the entrepreneur agreed to review his project. Backed by Gustave Eiffel, he adopted the solution of a canal with locks, better suited to the landscape of the region. But the turnaround changed nothing. After seven years, a billion francs had been squandered, with very little to show. On February the 4th, 1889, the company went bankrupt. When the Panama scandal broke, 85,000 small investors were left penniless. Now, 88 years old, the illustrious de Lesseps was found guilty, and only his advanced age spared him a five-year prison term. While the French licked their wounds, the Americans began their move to gain the upper hand in the region. Theodore Roosevelt wanted the canal, regarding it as the centerpiece of a future world empire. The United States thus redeemed the French concession, making the area around the canal US territory. The first priority of Roosevelt's men was to tackle the health issues. In 1903, before continuing the construction work, more than a year was spent killing all the mosquitoes in Panama. Because in the meantime, it had been discovered that yellow fever and malaria were carried by mosquitoes. The US president then entrusted his army with the mission of finishing one of the largest engineering projects of all time. Confronted with the same geological difficulties as their predecessors, the Americans took up the aborted French idea of building a canal with locks. To supply them with water, they created a dam on the Rio Chagres, flooding a good part of the area and producing a huge artificial lake, Lake Gatun. Located 26 meters above sea level, it allowed the isthmus to be crossed without having to excavate the mountain. Access was by two sets of locks, each of a size to match the scale of the project, boasting 25-meter high gates and 320-meter long locks. To stabilize the ships during the passage, an innovative system of locomotives acted as tugs. On August 15, 1914, after a 30-year construction project that claimed the lives of 27,000 men, the gates to this new inter-oceanic highway were opened. The 77-kilometer canal connecting the Pacific and Atlantic was regarded as the fourth wonder of the world. The voyage from San Francisco to New York, previously 22,500 kilometers, was now only 9,500 kilometers. While Europe went to war, the young American nation became the world's leading military power and seized control of the region. More than 100 years after the first ship sailed along the canal, Panama entered a new era. On January the 1st, 2000, after some tough negotiations with the USA, the country took over the canal zone. A forest of skyscrapers has grown around old Panama City, which is now a major financial center. For the canal, such commercial success is nothing new. Together with its associated activities, it represents 40% of the country's economy. Now the sole masters in charge, the Panamanians recently carried out some major works to provide cargo ships with a brand new canal with locks. It's incredible. It's 
Hello. The Titanic project was supervised by Ilya Marotta. This Panamanian engineer has dedicated nine years of her life to the canal. We needed new locks because shipping uh, industry was getting bigger. So big, the vessels were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and we were maxed out. So we needed more capacity for more vessels, and then we needed to attract bigger vessels that couldn't fit through the existing Panama Canal. Otherwise, we would lose market share and we wouldn't be a world canal. Which lock size did you choose? So the width is 55 meters, and the length of this chamber is 427 meters. And the biggest vessel we can put in is 366 meters in length. And so far, a 49 and a half meter vessel can come in. The amazing thing is that it means that you can now fit an Eiffel Tower lengthways in the locks. <laughs> Actually, we could have built 19 Eiffel Towers with the amount of steel that was used to reinforce these concrete walls, 19 of them. So it's a pretty big project. Yes, so. it's a gigantic project. This new project began in January 2007. Responding to competition from the Suez Canal, Panama is expanding its shipping channels, transforming the legendary Culebra into a giant minefield. The biggest challenge, though, lay in the construction of a third set of locks to accommodate even larger ships. The new reinforced concrete chambers have 16 sliding gates, each over 57 meters high. After nine years of work, Panama opened its new locks, tripling the capacity of cargo ships, which can now embark nearly 14,000 containers. What did you include in the specifications when you decided to build the new locks? In the old locks, we have locomotives, which help position the vessel in the middle of the chamber. Here, we did not use locomotives. Why? Because it was too expensive. The walls would have to be heavier to sustain the weight of the locomotives. More equipment, more people. Also, the locomotives and the cables would have to be too big for these type vessels. Other than that, the gates, they're very different. The engineers decided on an innovation, replacing mitre gates with sliding ones. The gates range from 2,400 tons to 4,200 tons. But only 15% of the weight is what gets moved with the motors. 85% uh, of it is floating. Because each gate has a floating compartment that allows the gate to be like a ship so it's not that heavy to move it. Basically, you can't mess with Archimedes' principle. Yes. The last challenge of this project was to preserve the water of Lake Getun, which supplies the canal and its locks. Each giant container vessel passing through drives no less than 197 million litres of water to the ocean, gradually emptying this indispensable reserve of fresh water. Yes, water is key for the Panama Canal because it's also the lake where most of our population drinks water from in the main cities. So we have to protect water, save water. So we decided to implement the water saving basins. What they do is all is gravity fed with different elevations of water. We're able to recycle 60% of the water per chamber. And uh, overall, these locks use 7% less water than the existing locks. So it's just a recycling system was becoming one of the great leaders of the Panama Canal a childhood dream? Um, this is a dream job for any engineer. It's uh, this project like this doesn't get built every day and it's very unique. The locks, the gates, everything, the physical systems, every single day there was something to resolve. Now when you look back, you're like, wow, we overcome a lot, but you learn, that's the beauty. So it was more good than bad. This technical prowess is also a financial success for the Canal Authority. Every cargo ship passing through pays a colossal sum, between $500,000 and $1 million. In an era when 90% of global trade is seaborne, the canal has become the economic heart of Panama, 
and one of the world's leading trade centers. But the country is already considering a fourth set of even larger locks to accommodate cargo ships over 400 meters long. The idea was prompted by China's plan to open a canal in Nicaragua, allowing through cargo ships carrying 25,000 containers, and in anticipation of the Arctic routes opening up as a result of climate change. Water is a major concern for mankind, and engineers have come up with some brilliant ways to divert it in order to create waterways that considerably reduce travel distances. In their attempts to master it, some have even managed to redraw the landscape and recover territories from the sea. The Venetians put some bold strategies into practice when they built a city that should never have existed. Venice sprung up in a huge lagoon dotted with marshy islands. The hostile site was specifically chosen by the Venetians to escape the barbarian invasions and protect themselves. Today, it's an architectural treasure, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. With its countless canals and palaces, Venice is testimony to mankind's genius for mastering water. When the first inhabitants arrived here, they learned a specific technique to build houses on this uh, uh, unstable ground, on muddy, on a very muddy ground. First of all, uh, with the technique of bonification and wooden pole, they created a basis. And below that surface, we have millions of poles that have been put uh, to make a stable ground. In St. Mark's Square, there are possibly 200, 300,000 poles. And when you are walking through Venice, uh, possibly you are walking uh, on top of the largest forest, fossil forest <laughs> in Italy. It's a very nice example of the way in which uh, Venice mastered the waters for centuries. Masters maybe, but still subject to the rhythm of the water. Aqua Alta uh, conditioning very much uh, life for Venetians. And when it happens, uh, everyone is obliged to go into the passerelle. Also for people uh, living in the houses, it's very unsafe uh, to live uh, on the ground floor and uh, it's better to stay <laughs> on the upper floor. The aqua alta is caused by many factors, making it very difficult to predict. In Venice, tidal phenomena account for only 20 to 30% of the aqua alta. During the highest tides, the water rises a maximum of 50 centimeters. Sea level is also affected by atmospheric pressure. High pressure above 1,013 hectopascals forces the sea down, while depressions cause it to rise. A big depression, then, can thus raise the water by up to 30 centimetres. It's often accompanied by heavy rains, which make the situation worse. Finally, a strong, constant wind blowing towards land can cause a significant rise in the water level of up to one metre. More and more frequently, the Venetian Republic is coming under threat from the Adriatic Sea. Probably the Aqua Grande of November the 4th, 1966. Driven by a storm and a strong southeasterly wind, the water rose to 194 centimeters above the reference level. Five thousand Venetians lost their homes. Concern that Venice might be swallowed up entirely spread across the world.
In the 1970s, to save the city, a unique barrage was designed in the form of the Mose project. After 15 years of massive construction works, this ingenious system of floating gates attached to the bottom of the lagoon is entering its final phase. The system is managed from a control center. Since 2011, whenever floods threaten, computers can close the barriers virtually, simulating an emergency. On these screens, we see the information that the operator will consult when deciding whether or not to operate the gates. They arrive directly from each opening and give the status of each sluice. There is also marine weather data. So when do you decide to close an entry? The Italian state has defined the rules to put these mobile gates into operation. The water must rise to 1.10 meters above the reference level. When we decide to lift the gates, air is injected. They pivot around the hinges to a position of 45 degrees, the operational angle. To lower them, we inject water instead of air, and then they sink, returning to a horizontal position on the bottom. Why not tilt the gates at 90 degrees? We don't place them vertically, because at 90 degrees it would be very difficult to get them back in position on the bottom. From 45 degrees, gates can reposition themselves naturally thanks to the force of gravity. It's really clever. <laughs> it takes 30 minutes to fill the 78 valves with air and another 30 minutes to bring the gates to operational level. The movable barrier is designed to hold back up to three meters of rising water. Was global warming taken into account in the Mose project? Yes. The Mose system is one of the first that the Italian state has carried out taking this problem into account. A hypothetical rise in sea levels of up to 60 centimeters in 100 years has been factored in. A high price has been paid by the Italians for this bold technology. An estimated 5.5 billion euros, not counting cases of corruption. This is the main grievance for the project's many detractors. They complain that the system does nothing to ease the main threat to the city, with Venice subsiding by several millimeters every year. Further north in Europe, in the Netherlands, a whole nation has made the control of water its speciality. Over the centuries, the Dutch have become formidable hydraulic engineers, reclaiming huge tracts of land from the sea. More than 20% of their country is built on previously submerged land, reclaimed from the sea, known as polders. Several centuries ago, in order to create polders, the Dutch first surrounded the area they wanted to build on isolating the marshes to be drained. Then they planted reeds to absorb the water. But this technique proved to be insufficient. They went on to cover the area with canals to drain away the water. The Dutch then built windmills with a screw to pump the water away, discharging it into a channel upstream towards the rivers or the sea. The Netherlands used more than 10,000 windmills to drain the land. In the 20th century, reclamation has intensified, completely redrawing the map of the country. On January the 1st, 1986, a new province was born called Flevoland. The new land was formed by merging two existing polders. With an area of 25,000 square kilometers, it's the largest polder in the world and the biggest dewatering project ever undertaken. Since the Middle Ages, the Dutch have reclaimed an area of 220,000 hectares from the sea. But the conquest has not been without consequences. One third of the country is below sea level, 
and 60% of the population lives in flood-prone areas. In 1953, a devastating storm forever changed the face of the country. On February the 1st, a very high tide coupled with the depression and roaring 150 kilometer an hour winds rose up against the North Sea dikes with phenomenal force. In the middle of the night, in the south of the country, 89 barriers gave way, allowing four and a half meters of glacial water into an area of 200,000 hectares. The result was devastating. 47,000 buildings were destroyed, tens of thousands of animals drowned, and most tragically of all, 1,835 people died. As a result of this unprecedented disaster, the Netherlands set about the largest civil engineering project ever undertaken, the Delta Plan. Over a period of 30 years, the project aimed to build the most powerful ramparts ever imagined, dikes and indestructible dams to lock out almost every arm of the sea and river estuary in the south of the territory. Near Rotterdam stands the keystone of the Delta Plan, the Eastern Scheldt Storm Surge Barrier. Completed after an extremely complex 10-year construction project, this innovative barrier is several kilometers long. Dozens of 42-meter wide, 5-meter thick steel gates allow the strong currents of the North Sea to pass through or repel them when the elements go wild. I imagine that building such a dam required many innovations. <laughs> yes, everything had to be invented. No structure had ever been built like it anywhere in the world. The original design of the Delta Plan provided for the construction of a conventional closed dam, and work began in 1974. However, environmentalists and fishermen protested because the oyster and mussel beds would not have survived. It would also have been a disaster for plants and other living organisms. So they stopped the procedure and the government decided to build an open dam instead. The engineers had to invent a completely new type of barrier able to support a flow of two cubic meters of water per second. Affixed to the seabed are 65 enormous concrete pillars, each weighing 18,000 tons. Between them are sliding steel gates moved into position from the control room as soon as the water reaches three meters above the reference level. It takes 75 minutes to complete this North Sea inlet. With this delta plan, the Netherlands has become one of the safest coastal territories in the world, thanks to its innumerable dikes and, more recently, its mobile water defences. Over the centuries, the Dutch have become specialists in mastering water. The expertise of their 2,500 companies and laboratories working on the issue is recognised worldwide. In Delft, Frederik Restagno, an expert in fluid mechanics, visited one of the most important hydraulic research centers in the country to find out about the work being carried out by his Dutch colleagues in their quest to develop increasingly effective coastal protection systems. It's really big. It is big, yeah. It's 75 meters long, almost nine meters width. In this kind of uh, wave basins, we do research on uh, dikes, ports, Storm surge barrier, like a project in uh, Venice, the Mosa project, storm surge barriers have been tested in this facility. What's special about this basin? Yeah, this is the Atlantic Basin, where we can generate not only waves, but also a current. So we have waves from that side, but we can have currents also uh, from that side. And that is important uh, if you have, for instance, uh, material that is being steered up by the waves and transported by the currents. All the experiments here deal with an unpredictable element, water. In order to simulate its behavior and collect accurate data, each pool is equipped with one or more wave generators. The waves here don't have a very regular form. 
No, like in the reality, not each wave is the same. So uh, when you look to a storm, you have higher waves and you have lower waves. You have longer waves and you have shorter waves. Depending where we are in the world, the frequency of the waves uh, might be different. We know how to program that uh, to the wave generator, um, and that is very essential. It's a tool that allows scientists to study the resistance of dikes in the long term, as well as in extreme situations. For analysis purposes, researchers have built a 300-meter-long canal. This is the distance required to reproduce the gradual formation of waves and allow 4.5-meter high waves to be generated. Giant basins are also essential for large-scale study of how to protect increasingly threatened coastlines. Has global warming increased demand? Of course, so it is one of the aspects that we deal with in each project. We need to construct dikes that we can easily adapt if the sea level rise will be more than what we expect now. But if your expectations is, is wrong, and it, it's not one meter, but it's two meter or three meter, then you still uh, should be able to adapt the structure to a different sea level rise. Here in Holland, such tests must be particularly important. Yes, in the Netherlands, it's very important that we have facilities like this to investigate. If we make an uh, error, the consequences are much larger in the Netherlands than in other countries. The increased risks led the Dutch government to launch a new Delta plan in 2015 to strengthen and heighten many of the country's surge barriers. A rise in sea level of between 65 and 130 centimetres is predicted by 2100, and up to 4 metres by 2200, aggravated by subsidence of the soil and significant erosion of the coastline. In order to limit greenhouse gas emissions, engineers increasingly harness the tremendous power of water. The impressive nature of hydroelectric dams means that they produce almost 80% of the world's renewable energies, compared to 12% for wind, 7% for biomass, 1% for geothermals, and 3% for solar. In the 20th century, 70 dams in 14 different countries are the work of brilliant French engineer André Coyne, the undisputed master of the Arch Dam. His creativity has inspired generations of builders. What characterized André Coyne was his desire to experiment and work things out in the best possible way. He made a range of innovations. Spillways, for example. Whenever floods occur, it is important to protect the foot of the dam from damage by the increased flow. He invented what became known as the ski jump, which projects the water far enough away to ensure that damage is inconsequential. He also pioneered the incorporation of measuring equipment into the concrete. The calculations he came up with paved the way for further development of the arch dam. He also insisted that it had to be beautiful. It was André Coyne's philosophy that nature must prevail. We do not impose on nature. We take a rather immodest step of barring a river, and we need to understand it. He was of the view that some kind of empathy must exist with the rock, the river, the concrete, and the earth. Putting oneself in nature's shoes is not being arrogant. On the contrary, it's a way of submitting to it completely. While Coyne became famous for arch vaults, often built in steep areas, there are other types of dams built in rivers, such as the Gravity Dam. All share a common feature. To build them, engineers must interrupt the natural watercourse. 
To build such a structure, it's first necessary to drain the area chosen for construction. The watercourse must thus be diverted into the banks through a temporary channel, or in more rugged regions, through huge diversion tunnels. The excavated rocks are then used to build coffer dams, dikes and temporary barriers that help drain the area. Once the watercourse bed is dry, excavation can begin. The solidity of the support is ensured through intensive studies and high strength concrete is used on any ground deemed unfit for the foundations. Once the site is finished, the coffer dams are dismantled to put the dam in water and create its vast reservoir. The quality of the rock is essential in building a dam. The moment when a dam is first put in water is one that no engineer, not even André Coyne, experiences with serenity. Of all the edifices built by man, said Coyne, dams are potentially the deadliest. His words were prophetic. In 1954, André Coyne completed the Malpasse Arch Dam in the south of France. The reservoir allowed the farms around Fréjus to be irrigated. It was built in the Réron Valley, a watercourse that runs dry in summer and floods in winter. The wait went on for several years until the water filled it completely, 1955, 56, 57, and there were no checks. There was nobody on the spot. Since there is no electric plant, the construction was there purely to collect water, there was no monitoring and warning signs went unheeded. Noises, water dripping in some places. On the left bank, the water had infiltrated the rock, which caused cracks and faults. Then on December 2nd, 1959, the dam burst. At around 9 p.m., a 40-meter high wave rushed into the narrow valley at a speed of 70 kilometers an hour, sweeping away everything in its path, breaking on Fraser's 20 minutes later before flowing into the sea. The damage was catastrophic, claiming more than 423 victims. France was in shock. André Coyne took full responsibility for the tragedy. When everything was checked, there was not a single miscalculation. In fact, the arch was well designed. It wasn't a design fault, it was a geological fault. The Malpasse tragedy prompted a rethink with engineers all over the world. They realized they didn't understand what was happening in the rock. Something we have learned is that the rock must be allowed to drain by drilling into it and tunneling to ensure there's no build-up of pressure inside the rock. Much of what we know about drainage and rock mechanics stems from Malpasse. But that doesn't mean it wasn't a dreadful tragedy. The biggest civil engineering disaster of the 20th century has significantly improved the safety of dams. All are now equipped with drainage systems. With ever large constructions being erected, security is an essential element and the energy potential is immense. Water is an asset widely exploited in South America, particularly in Paraguay, which is one of the few countries in the world that is 100% hydroelectric. Frédéric Restagno went to this small state sandwiched between Argentina, Bolivia and Brazil. Although landlocked, the country is crossed by one of the largest rivers in Latin America, the Parana River, which forms a natural border between Brazil and Paraguay. Driven by several waterfalls, such as Saltos del Monde, it drains an immense volume of water with unparalleled power. A few kilometers away, this resource has allowed Paraguay and Brazil to jointly build the binational Itaipu Dam. It's the most powerful hydroelectric plant in the world and one of the largest dams on Earth.
It's a really amazing place. It's gigantic. How big is it exactly? The dam measures nearly 7.5 kilometers. Its total height is 225 meters. 225 meters? Above sea level, exactly. How high is the waterfall? It falls 120 meters. Water hits each turbine, producing 700 megawatts. So each turbine is roughly the same power as a nuclear reactor. Itaipu Binacional has a capacity of 14,000 megawatts. So compare that with a nuclear plant producing 1,000 megawatts. That's the equivalent of 14 nuclear power plants. It's really amazing. This monster supplies almost 90% of the electricity consumed in Paraguay and 50% of its Brazilian neighbor's electrical power, thanks to an architecture and location that was thoroughly studied by engineers. What kind of dam is the Itaipu Dam? It's a gravity dam built on very solid basaltic rock, the same as can be found along the river. It was built on the Parana River Canyon. The site of the Itaipu power station was chosen by engineers because this was where it was possible to extract the most electrical energy from the flow of water into the power plant. They have achieved the best possible rate of productivity. So it's a combination of water flow and geology that makes this the optimum location? Yes. Completed in 1991, the structure forms a gigantic 1,350 square kilometer reservoir. But the sacrifices demanded by this incredible dam are commensurate with its height. To create the lake, the authorities had to displace 10,000 families and drown the rainforest beneath 100 meters of water. The first dam construction site with an animal rescue plan the site is now classified as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. The plant and dam stand on exceptionally strong foundations capable of holding back 29 million cubic meters of water. Oh, it. <laughs> it's gigantic. Yes, it is. And so this is the bottom of the Parana River. Are we really on the riverbed? That's right. These are the foundations. It's actually the base, the lowest level of the main dam. As you can see here, all this rock dates from the time of construction. Is the toughness of basalt important for the Itaipu Dam? Absolutely. So the dam is just standing on rock? In concrete terms, yes. But the strength of the dam rests on 81 billion tons of reinforced concrete. It's an impressive weight. To save concrete and not unduly burden the structure, which could damage the bottom of the river, the builders designed a hollow dam supported by buttresses. The architecture redirects forces to the bottom and thanks to its wider base, allows it to better withstand the enormous pressure of water. The dam thus stabilized, the engineers equipped it with 20 gigantic penstocks, creating a drop height of nearly 120 meters, which discharges 700 cubic meters of water per second directly into each turbine. Electricity is produced at the foot of the structure in the largest hydroelectric plant in the world. Okay, bueno, mira, esto, this is the big machine room. Below all these red covers are all the generators. It's crazy to think that this uses a simple principle of physics, which is the dynamo, only in absolutely gigantic dimensions. All physics is here. Electricity, fluid mechanics, electromagnetism, everything. 
pretty much everything. Here we apply practically all the sciences of engineering. But despite their ability to provide clean energy, even larger dams involve sacrifices with populations displaced and hydrological regimes and water ecosystems modified. Any cost that building this dam might have had on the environment, I can ensure you, are outweighed by the benefits, starting by the huge amount of energy produced, which is clean. And if we look what you would need to do to create the same amount of energy, our calculation is about 500,000 barrels of oil per day. Itaipu's production allows us to avoid about 85 million tons of CO2. Controlling water is, first of all, about using it in the best way possible. But it's also about really understanding the water cycle, treating it as well as possible, and not spoiling it at any time. 